Okay, so having talked about the fetal period of development and also having talked about general embryology as a whole, something has come up that we may have malformations. Some embryological process may go wrong and we have an anomaly. So to summarize the lecture series on general embryology lecture series, I prefer finishing with this topic of principles of teratology. In this topic, we are going to learn mechanisms and causes of birth defects, basically teratology study birth defects. But let's define a few terminologies. As I've said, the first terminology I want us to define is teratology. Teratology is the study of birth defects. I also want us to define the term teratogen. Teratogen is an agent that causes a congenital defect. This agent can be a chemical, like a drug. It can be an infective organism. It can be physical factors like radiation. So all those are teratogens, an agent that causes a congenital defect. Now, there's a new word that has come up there and that is congenital. I want us to combine that with anomaly so that we talk about congenital anomaly. So, but in their distinctive definition, the term congenital means born with. So something that someone is born with is something congenital. The opposite of Congenital will then be acquired. Something that you're not born with, but you develop later. Then anomaly. An anomaly is a structural defect. And so when you use the term congenital anomaly, it refers to a structural defect that an individual is born with. And I am insisting on structure here to mean anatomical. So it's anatomical defect that an individual is born with. That's a congenital anomaly. Maybe I define more terms, although we use them interchangeably, but in its strict definition, what is a malformation? A malformation is a primary structural defect resulting from a localized error of development. There's a primary structural defect that is resulting from a localized error of development. There's a localized error of anatomic development that is morphogenesis. So that an organ then can be described as being malformed, which means it did not form appropriately. And there's a syndrome as well. What's a syndrome? A syndrome is a recognized pattern of malformations or defects, let me say so, with at least three abnormalities. So a syndrome is a pattern, and this pattern constitutes at least three things that tend to occur at the same time. They don't have to be three, they could be five, 10, whatever, but there are at least three things which tend to occur in common 
that will constitute a syndrome. Ask yourself, what are some of the syndromes you've heard about in medicine? Let them run in your mind. Right, we also have what you call disruption. So disruption is a specific abnormality that results from, now I've noted that I'm using the same term again, but let's use the term now disturbance. So a specific abnormality that results from disturbance of normal developmental process. I want you to get it that in this disruption, the normal developmental process began well. Development was going on well. Then something external disrupt the normal process. Something external disturbs and alters the normal process. That is a disruption. As opposed to the previous one, malformation, where the developmental process itself was wrong. So it was also not forming normally. And then in this last one, deformation. So this is basically something that formed first to completion normal. Then now something altered its shape. So that becomes a deformity. The normal developmental process was okay until completion. Then something disturbed the normal structure so that now it becomes deformed. So if you have to classify them in terms of the timing, you know, the earliest insult would be causing a malformation then somewhere in the middle when an organ is developing, an insult would cause a disruption. Then if the insult did not come at the beginning, then during the normal process, it comes at the end, then that insult will most likely cause a deformation. I have tried to define those terminologies. However, let me make it easier for you this way, and this should be um, liberating that even though I've given you the definitions of those ones, in clinical practice, people are not very strict on those terminologies. And so they sometimes just use them interchangeably. They can refer to malformation when they refer to, we are referring to a deformity, or they can call a, a deformity a disruption. And there are no hard lines about them, by the way. So it's okay, it's acceptable. But I just wanted to have a scientific meaning to all the terminologies as because we are learning teratology. In practice, you will not be bothered so much about you calling it a deformity instead of a disruption, instead of a malformation and the like. Feel free to use them interchangeably it still means that there's some structural problem anyway, which is congenital. So having given you some definition, what do we need to learn in this lecture of teratology? I'm going to take you some general principles of teratology, then I'm going to give you some common mechanisms that cause birth defects. We can't finish all of them. We'll just talk about some common ones. Then we'll talk about the morph common morphological defects, which means I'm just like to look at the anatomical defects. And uh, we'll talk about causes of birth defects, what generally cause these birth defects. And we'll finish with how we can make a diagnosis of birth defects before birth. So general principles of birth defects, but defects are not as rare as you may want to think. 
I consider two to three percent really common. And let me make it worse. That two to three percent only applies to the live newborns. If you are to consider the abortuses, those are children who have been aborted for whatever reason, then the percentage would actually increase because some of these abortions occur because of birth defects. So the percentage is slightly higher in abortions, maybe intermediate in the stillbirths, but live births, two to three percent. Congenital anomalies have a really wide spectrum. There could be those ones which are insignificant. You don't even notice them. To the ones that you notice, but not a big issue health-wise. Or some of them you notice, they're not a big issue health-wise, but they have some things to, to affect you in terms of your appearance. So you're worried about um, how you look. So they have cosmetic importance. Yet to the other extreme, you may have those which are life-threatening and actually not compatible with life. So it's a wide spectrum. It's also important to note that multiple malformations can occur in one individual. Or an individual can just have one malformation, but multiple malformations can also occur in one individual. And when multiple uh, defects occur in one individual, it doesn't necessarily mean that's a syndrome, but it may also be a syndrome. When you look at the trends and the prevalence of these congenital malformations, we see that there are some geographical and ethnic patterns. There are some malformations that you see them in some particular regions of the globe, more common than what you see in other regions of the globe. For example, you may be having children being born without limbs in a particular geographical location within the world, the prevalence is higher in this particular region A compared to region B. Some of them also have ethnic lines. This would mean therefore that there are some people in some particular tribe, they just born in this particular way. These geographical and ethnic differences tell us something more about the causations of congenital malformation. That there are most likely some genetic links to them, but there could also be some environmental links to them. You see geographical location would still strongly suggest environmental and partially suggest genetic. Ethnic would strongly suggest genetic and partly perhaps geographical or environmental. So those are some of the general principles. Let's talk about common mechanisms that lead to development of congenital malformations. A congenital anomaly can occur because a particular organ was not induced to form. In this case, we will have congenital anomalies which lead to absence of an organ. So this type will give us absence disorders. For example, there's no kidney. You want to call that renal agenesis. The lung did not form. You want to call that one pulmonary agenesis. 
I hope you noted that I'm picking organs which are usually bilateral. And I'm not picking the ones which are unilateral or the ones which are just alone, like the heart. Because you see, if you have heartogenesis, then it means uh, the baby will not be born. Or rather, there'll be no baby eventually. That would be an abortion. So an organ may not be induced to form. It may be absent. You may also have malformations which are due to persistence of an embryonic structure. And you should now be familiar with this one. For example, if the yolk sac persists, we get Merkel's diverticulum. If the primitive streak persists, we may get teratomas. So if an embryonic structure persists, you can get some malformation. If a lanto is persist, you get urethral malformations. Some of them may be due to inadequate or failed migration of cells. Cells are supposed to migrate from one point to another. And there are some organs that require migration of cells. For example, kidneys must migrate from the pelvis and go all the way to the abdomen. The thyroid gland must migrate from the tongue and descend all the way to the anterior lower neck. So tissues or cells usually migrate. If the cells don't migrate, then it means that they'll form organs in anatomical positions where they're not supposed to be. So this will give you basically organ ectopia. Like now you can have ectopic kidney, you can have ectopic thyroid. It means that the organ is not where it's supposed to be. If we can have inadequate migration, we can also have excess migration. The cells or the tissues have over migrated. That will still give you ectopic organs, basically. Examples of excess migration would be if the thyroid gland over migrate, so it doesn't stop at the neck but go to the thorax, we are going to have thyroid gland which is in the thorax. It's still ectopic thyroid. You may then have developmental arrest, which means what? That an organ started to form. An organ started to form, but the process stopped at some point. So the developmental process began, then it became arrested at some point. So the organ remains there as a tiny one. It's not completely absent or it may then involute. But the point is that the organ may have been induced to start to form, then become arrested at some point so it doesn't continue form. So you can still have absence or you can have hypoplasia when an organ is too small for the size. There are some malformations which are due to incomplete or partial separation. Some organs are supposed to separate. One part goes one side, another part goes one side. If that fails, you may have abnormal union. And in this case, think about the conjoined twins. They are partially separated. Then you can have malformations due to defective septation. An organ is supposed to form a septum that perhaps separates it into some chambers. So if the septum does not form, it means that the different chambers of this organ are likely to be in abnormal communication. Mm 
A good example that comes to mind so fast is the heart. Initially, the heart is just one big chamber, then divides into those four chambers. So if this separation, septation, sorry, into the four chambers doesn't go well, you may have abnormal communication between the chambers. For example, the right and the left ventricle may be in communication. That's what you call ventricular septal defect. The right and the left atria may be in communication. That's what you call atrial septal defect and the like. There are some situations where organs form and then the embryonic tissues are supposed to undergo resorption. So if that fails or is inadequate, then you may have some abnormality. And even the extreme excess resorption can also give you some anomaly. A good one that comes to mind is tongue tie. You know, the tongue is usually held in the floor of the mouth and some tissues are supposed to undergo resorption so that the tongue become freed. So if the resorption does not occur adequately, then you may get a tongue tie. Some organs are supposed to, as they develop, they merge, and perhaps the right and the left one come together and they merge. If embryonic structures fail to merge, you may get some malformation. And a good one that comes to mind is the development of the palate. In the development of the palate, one side come and another one come and the two meet together to form the palate. If that doesn't happen, you'll have a cleft. And that's why you call them cleft palate. You may also have cleft lip. You may have facial cleft. Generally, the right and the left structures usually come together to see to the development of the face, lips, palate. And so failure of fusion of merging will lead to cleft palate. There are some situations where organs which are not supposed to unite actually unite. And I'm calling that abnormal union for lack of a better term. So if organs which are not supposed to unite actually unite, they'll form one big organ. The parts which don't are not supposed to unite, unite, they form one big structure. And a good one that comes to mind is what you call horseshoe kidney, I'll show you one. So I've given you some common mechanisms that lead to development of congenital anomalies. This list is not complete. I've just tried to highlight some common mechanisms that can lead to congenital anomalies. Now I want to show you some common congenital anomalies and I've tried to pick for various systems. What you are likely to come across I'll be quick on this one though. So for example, in twinning, you can get conjoined twins. And we did this some time back. If they're joining the thorax, you call them thoracopagus. If they're joining the head, you call them craniopagus. If they're joining the abdomen, you call them omphalopagus or abdominopagus. So the mechanism here would most likely be in complete separation. You can also have malformations that affect the limb. Let's just call them limb malformations. A common one there called club foot or congenital talipes equino veras. This one here, we see six digits instead of five. Maybe it's hard to pick that, but now I believe you've seen it. This is what you call polydactyly due to formation of extra digital rays. We didn't talk about that mechanism, but it's there. We have formation of extra digital rays. Then we have this one, which is called syndactyly. Syndactyly is fusion of the digits. The mechanism here is failure of apoptosis so that we don't have adequate tissue resorption between two structures, the two fingers or toes, let's call them digits, are likely to be fused. Sin means fused. Some malformations that affect the central nervous system. So we may have this 
which we call spina bifida or spinal dysraphism. This one where the head is so enlarged, we call this hydrocephaly. And this one where some part of the brain is popping out, we call that encephalocele. So the first and the last are due to defective fusion, defective closure of structures. The one in the middle can be due to many mechanisms, including obstruction of CSF flow. There's some craniofacial malformation I mentioned to you about cleft lip, cleft palate, cleft face. So this is cleft lip and palate, failure of fusion. This is tongue tie, inadequate tissue resorption. Tongue tie is also called ankyloglossia. Ankylo means fused or held or tied. Glossia means tongue. In the first one, you see an individual with a very small mandible. A small mandible is called micronathia, although this would occur in form of a syndrome. The mandible is small, the lower lip is small. Look at the size of the ear, very tiny. Maybe you not sit nicely, but this ear is also slightly lower than normal. This is a syndrome. We call this one the first pharyngeal arc syndrome. You may have malformations of the urinary system like ectopic kidney, so failure of migration, horseshoe kidney, abnormal fusion, and what you call bladder extrophy. Bladder extrophy has a different mechanism, but basically the bladder become exposed into the anterior abdominal wall. We have malformations that affect the male genitalia, like the urethra may open on the lower part. Or you look at this and you wonder, is this male or female or female? Then you call it ambiguous genitalia. Or you may have this one where one of the testes is not really in the scrotum. It's undescended. We call this cryptokidism. Undescended testes is a common congenital anomaly. Some malformations that affect the female system, we generally call them Millerian duct malformations because the structure that gives rise to the female reproductive tract is called the Millerian duct. So some Millerian duct malformations could be just double uterus, double cervix, double upper vagina, or could be double uterus, lower cervix, sorry, single cervix and uh, a single vagina. So we'll discuss them again, but you may have what you call mirin duct malformations. There you see female genitalia that makes you think this is the penis, but not this is actually female. And so again, still ambiguous genitalia. Some abdominal wall defects, you may have absence of muscles of the anterior abdominal wall. We call that prune belly. Prune belly is usually in form of a syndrome. There are three constellations to this. We have hypoplasia of the anterior abdominal wall musculature. We have undescended testes, and we also have renal malformations. This one is relatively common. Umbilical hernia is a protruding umbilicus. Gastroschisis is relatively rare where the intestines are exposed. Malformations that affect the GIT, you may have this which you call omphalocele where the intestines are also exposed, but this omphalocele, the intestines are covered by membrane. In gastroschisis, they are not covered by membrane. Then you have this one where we see the small gut on the right and the large gut on the left. This is not the normal one. The normal one is usually the small gut is central and large gut is peripheral. So for you to have this means that the gut rotated abnormally. So we call it gut malrotation. And the last one, I think this is not the first time you're seeing it. We had called it earlier, Merkel's diverticulum due to persistence of the vitreline duct. 
just one of the vitreal and dark malformations. Still on the GIT, um, you may have hypertrophy, thickening, and obstruction of the pyloric sphincter. So we call that congenital pyloric stenosis. This tend to not necessarily be congenital because it commonly present between the sixth and the eighth to 10th week after birth. So we have reason to suggest that it's an acquired disorder rather than congenital. You may have blockage of the duodenum, you call that duodenal atresia. You may also have blockage of the esophagus, blockage of the ileum. And so if you ask to name some 20 even malformations of the JT, don't say the exam was hard. You can just start naming the atresias. Then you go to the stenosis, which means narrow. And then you go to duplication, which means there's an extra lumen somewhere. Last but not least, I want to talk about the congenital aganglionic megacolon, which is also called Hirschsprung's disease. This is due to failure of migration of neurocrest cells. Those ones that affect respiratory system, you may have abnormal communication between the tract and the esophagus, so we call that tract esophageal fistulae. You may also have congenital absence of the lung, and that's what we call pulmonary agenesis. Now, in this one, the right pulmonary, we have a right pulmonary agenesis, which means that the right lung is the one that's absent, the left lung is intact. Malformations of the cardiovascular system, you may have abnormal connection to the ventricles, so call that VSD, abnormal communication between the atria, you may call that ASD, atrial septal defect. But you may also have some that occur in form of syndromes, like a common syndrome is tetralogy of follow, where there are four malformations involved. We'll talk about them later. You may also have coarctation of the aorta, where coarctation here means narrow. So the aorta has a narrow segment. Malformation the skin, albinism is common to us. Vitiligo is also not so new to us. But the last one, you may have excess keratinization. This is what we call ichthyosis. Malformation that affect the breast are also not left behind. Like in the first one, the breast may completely not form and you're female. This is not the back of this woman, this is the front of this woman. So we call this a mastia. Or the nipple may have been inverted slightly inside, we call that inverted nipple. Or a woman might just have extra breast and extra does not mean here that the one that's there is big. It means that there's actually another one independent of the other one. And so we call this polymastia. Great, I've given you common morphological disorders. Now let's talk about causes of congenital anomalies. What causes congenital anomaly? Congenital anomalies can be caused by things we don't know. That's not a good way to start. But I put it here as number one, because it captures a very big proportion of the malformations. In 50%, you can't tell what caused a congenital anomaly. In 18%, there are some identifiable genetic factors that have been associated with development of some malformations. And in 25%, and sorry, in 7%, there are some environmental factors which have been linked to the development of congenital anomalies. I know you're wondering, so how do you take care of the 25%? And the answer is here. In 25% of cases, both genetic as well as environmental factors must be present for these malformations then to manifest phenotypically. That could be good news in one end, that you may be predisposed, but you don't have to expose yourself. If you're predisposed, it means you have the genetic predisposition. 
that does not equate to you getting a malformation. But if you get the correct environmental trigger, you can get it. Now, this also help us understand something that there are some congenital anomalies that can actually be prevented. And I want you to look at the screen again and ask yourself, what percentage of congenital anomalies can actually be pre prevented? So I'm giving you some 10 seconds to work that out. What percentage of congenital anomalies are actually preventable? 10 seconds. All right, I hope you got 32. Let's look at the genetic causes of congenital malformations. I've told you that you have genetic causes, we have environmental causes, and we have multifactorial, which means both play a role. If we start with the genetic causes of congenital anomalies, there could be abnormalities in the chromosome or abnormalities in the gene. So if there are abnormalities of the chromosome, it could be the number of chromosomes. And the examples would be trisomies, like trisomy 21, trisomy 18, trisomy 13. It could also be a monosomy, like Turner syndrome. But there could also be structural defects, which means the number of chromosomes is okay, but the structure of the chromosome has a problem. This may not give us so much of anatomical disorders, but they give us some functional disorders and you can check those two out. How about the gene mutations? Gene mutations are classified based on the type of chromosome involved. If the mutation involved the first 22 chromosomes, then we call that mutation autosomal. If the mutation involves the 23rd chromosome, then we call that one a six linked disorder. When there is a sex linked disorder, you want to go further ahead and ask yourself, is it linked to the, sex, to the X chromosome? So you call it X linked or is it linked to the Y chromosome? Then we call it Y linked. Gene mutation can also be classified as dominant or recessive, depending on how they manifest. If I have a gene, I've inherited it from my, one of my parents and that genetic disorder always show as long as an individual has the gene, then that is a dominant mutation, dominant trait. It always show, even if you inherit it only from one of your parents. Recessive disorders can only present if you inherit it from both of your parents. However, the individuals with a recessive disorder that has been inherited from only one parent are now termed as carriers. We combine the first and the second concept to give us some common terms like autosomal dominant disorders, autosomal recessive disorders, sex linked recessive disorders and the like. Let me take you through a few of them. So like here, I want to take you through those ones which are autosomal dominant. In this case, you see someone with a very large pupil. The reason is because the iris is very tiny or hardly there. 
congenital aniridia is congenital absence of the iris. It is autosomal dominant, which means if your parent has this one and you have the gene, you will definitely have it. Even if your mother doesn't have, but your father has. Achondroplasia is also another one. Achondroplasia is just very short people and you've seen these ones. So achondroplasia is also uh, an autosomal dominant trait. Autosomal recessive disorders could include things like focomelia and uh, albinism. Those are autosomal recessive. You only express it if you have inherited the disorder from both of your parents. That does not mean that your parents must be having the disease. They could both be carriers. X-linked recessive disorders include things like ichthyosis, where there is hyperkeratinization and uh, hemophilia. Maybe not necessarily structural, but I like putting it here because a good example of X-linked recessive disorder, hemophilias. Okay, now let's say something about the environmental factors. So the environmental factors that cause congenital anomalies could be mechanical factors, like the one during pregnancy, like oligodramnions, amniotic band syndromes, and the like could be chemicals or drugs, could also be physical factors like radiation, or it could be infections and other diseases. Among the diseases that commonly cause birth defects, we call them touch infections. Sorry about that. So touch infections refer to infections that are associated with development of birth defects. Torch is T-O-R-C-H. Then usually apostrophe S, torch infections. The first T and O stands for toxoplasmosis. That's the name of the organism. R for rubella. C for CMV. It's and for cytomegalovirus, CMV. H for herpes virus. Then the last S, syphilis. Those are the infections which are known to cause congenital birth defects. So they are teratogens. I want to ask a question about um, environmental teratogens. And the question is projected to your screen. Make a decision about it. I'm giving you one minute. All right, I hope you've made a decision. Oh, there was another choice that was hanging. Well, that can only mean that's a wrong one. That's why I didn't notice its absence. Now your answer comes in this slide. When you look at environmental factors, There's some things that influence the environmental factors. One of them is the critical period of development. At what time did they appear? The critical period of development is the third to the eighth week of development. <clears throat> 
So if there is an environmental trigger, environmental teratogen that is present around that time, there'll be the highest chance of development of malformations. As opposed to if it happened much later, if you subject embryos or fetuses to teratogens at their 30 weeks of pregnancy, most likely you will not have a congenital anomaly in that sense, but you may have a functional deficit, a physiological problem, not an anatomical problem. But if you subject this embryo to something between week three and week eight, you may have an anatomical problem, a congenital anomaly. If you subject the same to earlier than three weeks, maybe it will just lead to the death of the embryo. The woman may not even know that she was pregnant. So environmental teratogens have their highest impact between the third and the eighth week of development. And so if I take you back to the previous question that I asked you, now you know why C cannot be the answer, but B would be the answer. The second thing that uh, affect environmental teratogen is the genetic susceptibility of the embryo. So this is based on the evidence that uh, if you subject embryos within a particular developmental period, maybe they're all eight week embryos or six week embryos, subject them to the same teratogen, same dosage. There are some embryos that will develop birth defect and others not develop birth defect, perhaps because there's some genetic predisposition to the same. And lastly, the dosage also matters a lot. If I take a large dose of teratogen and another person just sniff it, of course I'm at a higher risk of development of a birth defect. What are the consequences of an embryo or a fetus being exposed to a teratogen? This will come with some good news, by the way, and also some bad news, but let's hear them. Sometimes it may just lead to death of the baby. That's bad news. It may lead to death of the baby completely. The baby dies, the pregnancy become terminated because the baby was subjected to a teratogen. Sometime it may lead to a malformation or let me call it a congenital anomaly. That yes, it happened during the critical period when something was developing and so abnormal development. Sometimes it may just lead to a very small child. Everything else is normal, except this baby is small for the gestational age. We call that intrauterine growth restriction or retardation. So the baby might be normal, but the size of the baby is perhaps 20 weeks, yet the pregnancy tells us that this baby should be 36 weeks. Sometimes may have functional deficit in the newborn. Everything else is normal anatomically, but functionally there's a problem. Maybe there's something that don't function normally. Good news, it may still be normal. This is to mean that if a woman is exposed to a teratogen, it's not automatic that now they must have a malformation 
As a matter of fact, the number five is the commonest outcome. But that does not mean that we become careless because, you know, when something is 1%, when it occurs to you that 1% is actually 100%, you can imagine, God forbid, you can imagine now it affects your child and it's the only child you have. For you, it's 100%. Even if it's 0.0005% chance of occurrence. Finally, how do we make a diagnosis of congenital anomalies? We can make a diagnosis of congenital anomalies prenatally on some grounds. One, we can use some sampling techniques. We've talked about them, so I'll just rush through them. Sampling techniques are invasive because you must take a sample. So it could be amniocentesis. We've talked about it before. It could be chorionic villus sampling. We've talked about it before. Could be percutaneous codocentesis. This one we may not have talked about, but still ultrasound guided procedure where you acquire blood from the umbilical cord during pregnancy. The studies that you can do in these ones are fairly similar. You can do some genetic studies on them. For percutaneous codocentesis, you can also check some other problem to do the coagulation. Then we have imaging studies. Imaging studies are not invasive. So we have two, obstetric MRI and uh, obstetric ultrasound. Obstetric ultrasound is cheaper than obstetric MRI. So it's the first one to be done. Okay. Easily available, it can be done anywhere, anytime, very few minutes. Except if you're suspecting a malformation, then it's good to indicate that you want an anomaly scan so that the sonographer or the radiologist will be looking at all the organs one by one and confirming whether they're normal or abnormal. Usually there's some cost implication to them. Obstetric MRI is our second bullet. If we do ultrasound and there's something that is indeterminate, we can confirm with MRI. Right, so that's it. This image shows you obstetric MRI. So that's it. That marks the end of the lecture series we've been having on general embryology. We started from gametogenesis. We went to fertilization and its results. We talked about first week of embryonic development. We talk about female reproductive cycles, second week of embryonic development, third week of embryonic development, during which we talked about gastrulation as well as neurulation. Then we talked about fetal membranes, where we looked at the four fetal membranes. Then we'll also look at the placenta as well. Then today we've looked at the fetal period of development and we have looked at the principles of teratology. So that marks the end of the lecture series on general embryology. Our subsequent lectures on embryology will focus on systemic embryology, where we are looking at development of each organ system according to the ones that we have done. So I'll stop there and allow you to ask questions if you have.